and gentlemen, welcome back to another very special, as always, episode of the Hyperconscious Podcast. Today's guest is an award-winning real estate agent and investor. He is an author, a speaker, and the host of the Dream Nation Podcast, and from the the feel of it so far, a great human being. We are sitting down with the one and only Casanova Brooks. What is happening, my man? What's up, guys? Uh, first off, I want to say thank you for having me on the show today. I'm excited, and I just hope that I can really bring some value. I, I am sure you will be able to. That is reliant on us not asking terrible questions, so <laughs> let's hope we can ask you some good questions. So before we dig into your past, who is Casanova Brooks today? What does he do? And yeah, who is he as a person? Yeah, so who I am today, I think is is really who I've always been, and that's a relationship builder. Um, early on, I was fortunate enough to be moved into different scenarios, and we'll get into that from you know me growing inner city to then me now being in Omaha, Nebraska. But I felt like I always to get ahead, I had to build relationships because I didn't have a lot of things, but I did have my energy, I had my charisma, and I had my optimism, which always resulted in positivity. So I quickly learned that it wasn't about who I knew. Um, it was it wasn't about what I knew. It wasn't about who I knew. It was more importantly about who knew me, because I felt that the right people knew me, that they would take risks on me, chances on me. And so even though I necessarily didn't have all of the resources, if I had the relationship, that was better than anything. Mm. So I would always say that I'm a relationship builder. And, and when you talk about what do I do now, I think I still just build relationships at heart. Um, a lot of people know me through real estate, but of course, to get somebody to, you know, purchase or even sell their largest investment with you or even invest in any type of real estate, you have to have trust there. So you had to have built a relationship. Right. And then also uh, I own multiple other businesses. Um, my wife and I, we just started uh, seven months ago, almost eight months ago. Now we opened up a daycare center. And, and so I'm very, very honored and blessed to be able to to support my wife in that. And the reason why I bring that up is because I've always had an entrepreneurial mind. I've always been a very big thinker. I've always been out of the box and always looking to buck the trend. But my wife, she's very, very different than me. And if you look at any of my social media, you'll notice that like I'm out there a little bit more, but she's not. And so the opportunity that she had to open up this daycare center, she didn't come from this world. Nobody in her family is entrepreneurs or anything like that. But there's something that I always say, and I learned it from a, a song but um, it's don't get hyped for the moment, then start to backpedal. Hmm. So what does that mean? Like a lot of the times we get so excited, we get exposed to something new and we're like, yeah, we're going to go out, we're going to crush it. But then all of a sudden, when it comes time to even just take the first step of action, we allow that little voice in our head to take over. And now we suffer from paralysis of analysis. Hmm. So I'm very, very grateful and blessed that, you know, in this moment where she had one opportunity to really go after her dreams and, and she's always, she's a part of a big family growing up her, her, her mom and dad did foster care. Um, so it's always been in her blood to do daycare or some type of child care. 10 years ago, she first took her first crack at it. And we had an in-home daycare that she was running. But it only got up to about five or six kids. And the problem with that was we were young and all of her clients were friends of ours. So they were young. And so what we ran into or what she ran into more so, because I was just kind of helping out here or there, was people would say, ah, oh, my check wasn't enough, so I can't pay you enough. And you know, so then it's like, wait, 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 that's not how this works. So quickly <laughs> being so young, being 21, 22 at the time, she wound up letting that go and said, hey, you know what? I need more stable income because we didn't really know how to run a real business and we were running it out of the house. So she didn't let that deter her. She went and she got into nursing. Um, she wound up helping up a, a clinic at the, the largest uh, children's hospital here in Omaha. And then she wound up getting into title work for a couple of years, but she still had that as her passion. And then when it's small opportunity came about, um, which now is grant, which has grown into a large opportunity because she, I, I say we, but keep in mind, I just signed my name. This has really been all of her dream and everything else. So she's taken this from zero kids seven and a half months ago 
to now today, she's at 54 kids um, wow. full time and then another 12 kids of school age. And she has capacity for 87 kids. So she's grown this thing tremendously. I've just been a support in the marketing behind her, but she's living out her passion and her dream. And so I say that because as you all shared with me, there's a lot of women that are listening to this podcast now and, and they're trying to figure out how they can have more clarity purpose. And uh, hopefully that's an inspiring message for them because she's done that all on her own. And I'm so proud of her. Casanova, I love the fact that you let her shine so much and you help her shine so much. Alan and I are very focused on that in terms of our relationships as well. I don't love, I don't like the saying behind every successful man is a supportive woman. I think it's next to every successful man is a supportive woman. And I love the fact that you are spotlighting and, sh and shining that light on that. So I respect you even more than I already did, believe it or not. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I think as you guys uncover a lot more when it comes to my story, you'll see how inspirational, how monumental and how essential she's been in all of my growth and development. And even to this point that I am right now, um, definitely she's been right there on the side of me, but she has been behind me because there's times where I've wanted to just stop, mm. right? I'm no, I'm no different than anyone else, but she has been that person that's put her head down, put her forearm in my back and made me keep going forward. And obviously it's been the best decisions of my life so let's get into that right so now we're talking about modern day Casanova and the businesses and you know being successful and being award-winning and an author and a speaker and a host what was early life like for you like take us back to your childhood and how did you become such an entrepreneurial heart and mind like what was growing up for Casanova like yeah. So funny thing is I was raised by women, right? Three in particular. Uh, I was raised by my mom. So I'm, I'm originally from a single parent household. My mom, I was born and raised in inner city Chicago on the South side. So all of the gangs and things like that, that you see on the news, no matter where you are, when you think of what's going on in Chicago, especially over the last couple of years where the media has really put a spotlight on it. I was raised in the heart of all of that. So my mom raised me and then my grandma stepped in early on to try to be my father since my father was never in my life. On top of that, I have no brothers and sisters uh, on my mom's side, but last I knew I had 13 brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters on my dad's side. So that was, all I, but I never had a relationship with any of them. And I really still don't to this day because my dad never bridged that gap. But I do have a first cousin and my first cousin were nine months apart and she helped to raise me as well. So that's when I say I had three women that really helped to raise me. Um, it was really those three women until, you know, obviously I got with my wife, but growing up in inner city Chicago, I would say I, I never had a big brother. I never had anybody who told me, you know, what I really could be now. Here's what I'll say. I all I was never deprived of love and support. My mom and grandma always made sure that I had that. But I never had any financial literacy. I never had any financial resources. My parents never owned a house, a car, or even a business. So they didn't really know what, you know, to tell me to aspire to be, nor were they really doing anything, you know, that they thought that I would aspire to be. So for me, they just made sure that they always kept me with the positive mindset, which I think they did a phenomenal job of, of just telling me you could be anything that you wanted to be and, and trying to protect me from the streets, you know, gangs, violence, all those other things. So I remember my grandma, she would always send me to the library, even though that wasn't really what I wanted to do. And I mean, this when I say send me, it's like, at the end of the school day, um, I had to be on the bus and not just going home because, I mean, riding the public transit. And it's funny because I just had this conversation with my grandma about four or five uh -oh. months ago. And I put it on my Instagram. And so it's out there and it's live. But telling my grandma, like, I'm seven years old, yeah, maybe eight. And she puts me on the bus and I have to basically go about three to four miles on public transportation with nobody watching me to the public library. And then she would call that library around like three 30 and just make sure I made it because that was the time that I was supposed to be there. So it's like, she always was looking out for me and trying to put that structure in life, which I think helped me. But growing up inner city Chicago, there was a 
lot of things that I could have always been um, abducted by, right? Which is gangs, violence, fighting, a negative mindset. But they did so well to try to shield me from that. Up until the point where I was finishing out my sixth grade year and uh, my grandma, basically a lot of my cousins started with one of my cousins who graduated college up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So she winds up uh, getting a job opportunity going to uh, Sioux City, Iowa, at the time, she got this job with what's called IBP, or at this time, it was called IBP. And now you know that as Tyson Foods. So if you go into any grocery store, that big Tyson food, like the meat company, mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys have seen that. Yep. But anyway, so she got the job opportunity working there. So she's the first one out of Chicago that migrates. And then word gets back around to my grandma that everybody's going to Sioux City, Iowa. So next thing I know, less than two weeks later, my grandma and I were on a Greyhound bus going to check out Sioux City. And then less than two months later, my grandma makes the decision that all of our stuff is going to be put in a U-Haul and we're moving to Sioux City, Iowa. So huge, huge culture change for me, right? Like, right. I mean, growing up, I only saw people who look like me. We never traveled. I never got out of Chicago to now all of a sudden I'm surrounded by diversity and I just really got to figure this thing out. But I'm only, you know, 12, 13 years old. So I'm like, man, so when I talk about in the beginning, having to really figure out how to build relationships, it was just way different because it wasn't anybody who really looked like me. So I was trying to figure out what do we have in common, but I couldn't allow myself to still just be a, a uh, recluse and just sit in my own bubble. So I had to get out there. I had to figure out, okay, how am I going to just try to find some type of happiness? And of course, it's not that hard because when you're 12, 13 years old, you're still trying to figure out how to fit in um, in a world where or you're trying to figure out how to stand out in a world that we're often taught to fit in. Mm. So you're trying to figure out how to fit in as well. So there's a lot of those things. Um, when you ask about how did my entrepreneurial journey start, I would say that it started when I was in Chicago, because if I remember right, my first job that I took upon myself, I was about eight years old. And um, I wanted to try to figure out how to have money. And my parents didn't really have anything. My mom always used the saying, that she was robbing Peter to pay Paul. And so she didn't have a lot of money to, to give me. So what I would do was we lived by a gas station. I would go to that gas station and basically you would come out and I would be standing in front of your car and I would say, hey, if you don't mind, can I pump your gas? Um, and you'd say, mm, some people would say no, but many more people, so some young little kid, they would say, yeah, that's fine. So then right when you come out of the thing, because at this time, everybody wasn't just using their credit cards to get gas, right? You'd have to go into the gas station, give them cash and then come back out. And so, um, you come back out, I pumped your gas and I just say, thank you so much. And then you would say, Hey, this is a little kid out here trying to do something. He's not, you know, causing any crimes. And you'd give me 50 cents, a dollar, a couple dollars, whatever you had that you could tip with. And then, you know, before I knew it, I was starting to earn like 10, 15, $20 just by standing out there for three to four to five hours. And at eight years old, when I didn't have any, you know, types of expenses, then I would then feel like I was rich, right? Yeah, I could you were go balling. Buy right. I was <laughs> balling. And I didn't really have to ask my parents for money. And, and I felt like I was being grown. And so all those things kind of played it into part. So for me, early on, I think that was the first job that allowed me to understand that, it, you know, I could really go out there and make my own money and create my own success. Mm -hmm. And then when we moved to, to Sioux City, I still was doing little odd jobs. I remember um, delivering papers, right? Even this is at, at um, 13 years old, 4 a.m. in the morning, getting up, delivering papers, because what else was I going to do? And I always, I wanted to control my own time more. So that was something that I knew early on. Like I always wanted to be the controller of my time. So what did that mean? Like I didn't want the traditional of like where somebody's going to tell me my shift was 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. and I had to go push carts. I did that, right? But I quickly learned that these this wasn't for me. So I tried so many different odd jobs. Um, and then, you know, that was kind of how my entrepreneurial journey went. And, and that's kind of where I'll leave it and, and see where you guys want to take it from here. Well, so when you're seven, eight, nine, ten, like when you're super young and you're pumping gas to make money and then you're, you have a paper route, and you're getting up at four in the morning. Like I get up super early and I know people that are my age that still struggle to get up at that, at that time. Can you remember like, how motivated were you by the money? Like, was that what you were thinking of? Is like, I have to do this for the money because this is my way out? Or 
did that motivation ever leave or were you just like super focused on, you know, kind of having that freedom and making your own money? Yeah. So I'll be honest and say that the motivation did leave. And the reason why is because obviously I'm not still uh, pumping gas and I'm not still (laughs) passing out papers. So the motivation definitely left. I think what I was always most excited by was the experience. Right. And that's where I think we lose a lot of the times for me. I'm always willing to try anything. And even up until this day, like I'm not I I don't like heights. Right. But would I would I skydive? Absolutely. Would I continue to skydive? Probably not. But I'll do it at least once. Mm -hmm. So everything for me is just being, you know, we have one short time span on this on this earth. Right. You know, we look at Kobe Bryant being 41 years old. We all saw what happened. So tragic. Right. But luckily he was able to impact millions and millions of lives, you know, and he went after everything that he wanted. So for me, I think early on, I didn't really I wouldn't say that I was super motivated by the money. I wanted to have some money, but I didn't really know what I was even going to do with the money. Mm. I just wanted, like, I seen that somebody was out there doing something and I knew that without money, just for me, money's not everything, right? But not having it can cause you a lot of pain and a lot more stress and grief. So I wanted some money and I knew that my parents, if I was going to ask them for the money, that was going to cause more stress and grief on them. So I said, how can I do my part? Right. And then I would see like, okay, well, you're doing a paper route. Well, let me see what that's like. Right. And then I tried it. And and then I so I think what it really boiled down to was I had to expose myself and try enough different things to where not only did I know what I liked, but more importantly, to know what I didn't like, because that was going to keep me on the path of doing what I did like, which was going to leave me feeling purposeful. So that was what I was always doing. I would say I, I, I was motivated by being exposed to something new. And I think if I could, you know, just add into that a little bit, think of us as children and think of the children. Do you all have any kids? No. Mm-mm. Got it. Okay. So once you start to get kids and I'm sure you might have little brothers and sisters, or you might have nieces and nephews. And what's the one thing that we want to make sure they do. We want to make sure that they try everything. Right. And so that's what I think early on, I didn't really even have the opportunity to try everything. Right. Being honest, like I, we being in Chicago, we only went to beaches. I never had pools. So nowadays, being honest, I'm I'm 32. And the joke a lot of the time is about like, uh, you know, me swimming. So a lot of times black people just in general, people talk about can black people swim. Right. And, And things like that. Well, for me, I was only taught to just go up to where my neck could touch. I never got swim lessons when I was younger. I never got driving lessons when I was younger. I had to figure it all out myself. And so for me, that was always the thing. Like, how can I expose myself to as many things? And that's what I try to do for my kids as well. And I think a lot of people listening at this, they could re- they can resonate with it to thinking like, hey, I, I don't want my kids to just specialize in one sport or to only do just band. I want them to do show choir as well, or I want them to find their artistic you know, values and I want them to figure out what do they really love in this life. And so that's what I think I just carried with me along the way. Casanova, you mentioned at the very beginning of this episode, you used a word that I absolutely am obsessed with, which is design. I'm an engineer um, and I love the word design, especially lifestyle design. I think one of the biggest mistakes we make is we don't explore enough of different things to then design a life that we love. And my question for you is, you've obviously designed a life on your own terms. You want to be in control of your own time. I'm seeing some common themes. What does lifestyle design mean to you? Because I saw a... What are those called? The things that Look, I Look, man, you think I'm a geographist? I don't know. It's the, the four circles together, right. and then in the middle, it's your purpose, I believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I know exactly what you're it's talking about. It's got love what you do, what are you good at, what does the world need more of, and then what you can get paid for, and then your purpose is in the middle, passion, mission, profession, and vocation. Can you go into right. what lifestyle design means to you? I told Kevin prior to this episode, this is going to be fire, because I can tell that you know some stuff. Drop it on Yeah, us. absolutely. Absolutely. And so here's what here's what I do know. I know that time waits for no one, as we know. Right. So for me, as I looked at I wanted to create a life by my design. What did that really mean? That meant that I had to stop 
for me early on, I think when we first started looking at things, we always look at what's in it for us, which is natural, right? I mean, as a kid, and I always go back to my kids because I have an eight-year-old son and a two-year-old daughter. My son is now not nearly as possessive as my daughter is, Mm. right? The younger you are, you're very, very possessive. So as you decide to get older and just like you all putting on this podcast now because you're trying to pour into more people who listen at this, you start to understand that, hey, at the end of the day, I need to leave a legacy, right? And so here's what started this for me and what made the click. We talked about Warren Buffett and me, you know, now living in Omaha. So someone had asked Warren Buffett and I heard this story and they said, hey, Warren, how do you know when you've truly been successful in life? And Warren said, you know, you'll never know. And so for anybody who follows Warren Buffett or maybe doesn't even know him, what I gained to know in the beginning was Warren Buffett A lot of people say he's an atheist. I don't know if he's an atheist, but he looks at himself as more of a realist, right? He just looks at, hey, if we have compound interest, if we're disciplined, things like that. He doesn't talk about like higher powers and God and all those other things. So when someone asked him, they said, hey, how do you know when you've truly been successful in life? And his answer was, you'll never know how truly successful you've been in life until you die. Mm -hmm. And people say, what? Like Warren Buffett is talking about afterlife and death. Like, what does that mean? And he said, you know, you'll never know until you die and you see how many people come to your funeral. But more importantly than that, you'll never know how truly successful that you've been until you see how many people cry at your funeral, because those are the people who you've truly impacted their lives. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was like, wow, Okay, like like that's something that means something for me. And so I looked at this and I said, okay, well, how do I start to do something that one, we have to make money, right? And and when you talk about building legacy, you probably have to build some type of generational wealth. So for me, I started out and I was like, okay, I'm selling all of these different products, but yet I never felt that I was selling anybody, anything that would live on beyond them. So what does that mean? If I sell people cars, which I started out doing early on in my sales career, and I crushed it at that building relationships, but what's the problem with the car? It's a depreciating asset, Mm -hmm. right? So over the long term, how long are you going to have that car? You might have it five years, maybe 10 years. Even if it's a classic, maybe you keep it 15 years. But at the end of the day, that's something that's never going to live on to really have the impact um, for your family. And then I sold everything else. I sold advertising, all these other things. But then I started to see, okay, well, what really constitutes like generational wealth? And I started to think like land is that one thing that we can never make more of. Mm right? Mm. You can make more of anything else, but you can never make more land. And on top of that, when we look back hundreds of years ago, what has always been the American dream, right? It's buying property. But then at the same time, people will always need a place to live. And so it just really compounded everything. It was allowing me to have a purpose because I'm helping other people build generational wealth, right? And it's not just on a single family property. It could be on a multifamily property where they can create cash flow right now. So they love me right now. But then even if we look at this three to five years from now, now they've built more wealth and then they can tap into that and they can leverage that to send their kids to college, to start a new business that's a, that helps to live a life by their design, but then also they're able to connect more people um, with their resources and things like that. So that was where real estate came in for me. And that was what it really meant. But ultimately, if I could help enough people get what they want, it would be able to allow me to have more control over my time, my freedom and my impact on people. And so when you think about it and you say, I think everybody has to think bigger, right? And the reason why I say that is because, again, we start out thinking just about ourselves. But when you really start to think about how can I change other people's lives, all the money will come from that. And so, but you have to do something that is meaningful, right? And so what does that mean? Like, what? how do I know what's meaningful? You have to figure out what are other people struggling with? Because we all have a gift. Right. And so if you don't know what is my gift, ask yourself what comes easy for me and harder for others. Mm. You said I'm already an engineer. That's a fire question right there. Go ahead. Keep going. Sorry. 
Absolutely. You said, hey, I'm an engineer. Right. right? So you see things in a different spectrum. Right. You already, you know, you're very analytical. You can see things where other people cannot. And if you say like, hey, you know, I'm just very curious. Okay, well, you ask the right types of questions. Journalism. We see journalism through blogging now, through podcasts now, right? And if you say, okay, well, I just want to sit, I just want to sip coffee all day and ask people or listen to people's stories. Well, then I would go to argue to ask you, what does Ellen do? Mm, right? Yeah. What does Oprah do? Right. That's what they do. So figure out again, you don't need to figure out what's in it for you. You need to figure out what's in it for everyone else. Jeff Bezos, the reason why he's, you know, almost a trillionaire, but obviously more of a billionaire right now, multi-billionaire is because think of how many other hundred millionaires that he's created. Right. It's from his companies because all of the lives that he's impacted. Think of all the convenience that we have now every holiday season. Thinking back five years ago of all the stress that we had of of will this present come in? Uh, will this present come in time? Will it be delivered on time? How do we know what to buy? But now you just go to one website and you know that you can have this within two days, especially if you start early enough. Yeah, <laughs> I ordered something yesterday. And I was like, oh, I can't, there's no overnight shipping on this. This is ridiculous. And then <laughs> right? Alan was like, what a time to be alive. <laughs> right. Absolutely. But, but it's we true. Were, it's, it's absolutely true. My wife and I, we were just this whole last week, we just got back on, on Sunday, but um, we were in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico all last week. Right. And, and this was on a leadership thing and she came along with me. But what was so convenient about it is back, let's look at 10, 15 years ago, right? There was no cell phones really. And definitely there weren't things like Skype and Zoom and all these other things. What, what it allowed us to do was to have peace because every morning before our kids went to school, they were able to Skype us. Us, right. And every night before they went to bed, they were able to Skype us, you know, so that allowed for one us to be comfortable. But for two, for them to not say, I want my mom, I want my dad, like thinking about, oh, my God, are they OK? And them thinking about, oh, my God, what are they doing? It, it removed all of that. So when you think about other people and you think about how can I help them, what problem can I solve? And if you're trying to figure out, OK, what are, what problems do do I have? Just really take one day, even take a half a day and go, you know, sit down with three to five of your closest friends or, or go to a meetup.com and meet up with other entrepreneurs and figure out, okay, Hey, well you have this business that's going really well, but talk to me about what's a struggle that you have even today, or what's a struggle that you had, you know, when you first got started mm. and they're going to tell you what the struggle was. Right. And then all you say is how can I solve that problem? A right. lot of the times, if we just come from service rather than thinking about a product, if you just come from a level of service, everyone has a problem. It could be email handling where you can become a VA. It could be marketing where you can learn a skill like Facebook ads or copywriting. It, come, it could become design where you can learn how to do um, websites or click funnels. Everyone has a problem. Or maybe it just comes from PR. And if you're already someone who's super connected in the community, if you're already a part of the motherhood groups and things like that, how can you bring resources to other mothers? Others, whether they're soccer moms, whether they're whatever, bring value to them. And then you they'll tell you what more of their struggles are. And then you create a business around that. But then you already know that you had the impact. Casanova. So say you do that, right? Say you ask the right people, the right questions, you understand the need that you're trying to solve. I think one of the problems that a lot of people run into, and I know this was a problem for me early on, getting over that initial fear of sales. How so again, a lot of our listeners are early, you know, as entrepreneurs and they might have their service or their product or their mission or their passion, but it's one thing knowing it and it's another thing selling it. What, what are some of your tips for people who might be early on in this journey and they're afraid of sales, they're afraid of making calls, they're afraid of putting their, their service out there, they're afraid of making money from something that they've created? Yeah, I think the first thing and, and just to really be blunt is to understand that you're being selfish, right? And so what does that mean? This is something that I told my wife um, about what uh, this was probably about a year ago. We had just as coincidentally, I think we had just came back from either the, the uh, 
Click Funnels conference or the 10 X conference, which I took her to both of those last year. And so I was telling my wife, this is prior to us opening up the daycare and she's still working a nine to five job at this time and does not know that two months from now, this opportunity is going to come up. But a lot of the times we don't want to get out there because we think only about ourselves where you're not understanding that this is not again about you. This is about someone else. So for me, saying that I don't want to get out there and tell my story. I don't want to talk about, you know, coming from cancer. I don't want to talk about any of those things. I had to get over that because there was somebody else out there that needed to hear it. So when to answer your question a little bit more, if somebody already has their product out there, right, understand that we as consumers, we all like to buy. The reality of it is, is we get this money. I don't know anybody who gets this money so they could truly sit on it. They might invest it, but they're investing it so they can buy something in the near future, right? right? So maybe 10 years, 15 years down the line, they're going to buy their kid's education, right? Or they're going to buy this big house, whatever it is. So understand that we're going to buy anyway. You're being selfish if you're not putting your product in front of my face, because understand that I'm going to go buy it from a competitor and that competitor's product might be shit excuse my language, compared to your product. And that competitor's <laughs> product might not have a true why behind it. And that competitor's product might not have the full customer service behind it. And that competitor's product might not be evolving into what I can grow with over the next five to 10 years. So you really got to get out of your own way and also understanding that we don't have to do it all ourselves. So this is a common misconception. I think when we all start out, we want to be entrepreneurs. But we get stuck in the rut and we start out with being a solopreneur and we get stuck there. Right. And that's because we don't want to give up any leverage. But understand that, again, Jeff Bezos, he's not the ultimate salesman. Mark Zuckerberg, I'm sure if you hold a conversation with him for long enough, it might get a little awkward, especially if you're not just talking about Facebook all day. Right. What they allowed other people to do was to live in their gifts. So what does that mean? Figure out what your strength is. Your strength might be in design. If it's in design, you have to go find somebody else who wants to sell, right? And you're going to give up a little bit of a commission. That's fine. But now you're going to be able to impact someone else's life because they know that they're backed by a purpose-driven product and a purpose-driven and mission-driven and value-driven company, which is you and, and everything that you stand for. So allow someone else to live in their gift if that's not your gift. And just give up some of the commission. Casanova, when? So you're very enlightened cat, for lack of better phrasing, and I love it. I love where this episode's going. But I want you to take us back to when you transitioned into personal development. Like, when did you connect? I mean, your podcast is called Dream Nation, right? Love it. Right. Okay. I want more people to create a brighter future on their own terms. I'm obsessed with lifestyle design, obsessed with personal development, obsessed with fitness, obsessed with improving and mastery. You obviously are too. It's so clear. When did that start? And when did you start really doubling, tripling, and quadrupling down on that? Yeah, great question. So I would say, um, obviously, I didn't come from this at all. This really happened for me going on about seven years ago. And I'll tell you what happened. Um, I, I was transitioning out of being a, a nomad for for lack of a better terms, which means that I didn't have a solid foundation to build on. I had my wife who... We've been together now going on 18 years. We've been married this year for six years. So obviously, I mean, we met, we're high school sweethearts. I always tell people I've been with her longer than I've not been with her. Um, (laughs) And it, it, it was great. But I'll tell you, I didn't start out with this type of a mindset. What happened was I was serving tables and here's where it all started for me. I was serving tables at a, at a, I wouldn't call it a high end restaurant, but like a mere mid-tier type restaurant. And so if you guys come into um, the restaurant on a Thursday night and I say, hey, what's up, Alan? And you says, hey, what's up, Casanova? And I'm just making small talk with you. I'm like, yeah, you guys, you're waiting on a table. And you're like, yeah, actually, we see those people about to get up in your section. We're waiting. You know, we're going to hopefully grab that table in your section. And I was like, okay, I'll make sure I'll clean it off. Well, it wasn't until about you know, probably about the 10th or 11th time that it started to dawn on me that like, listen, you could have went anywhere in the city tonight with your family, your friends, whoever, right? But not only did you choose to come to this restaurant, but you chose to wait in a world of instant gratification so you could sit in my section. And I started to think, why is that? 
And it was like, well, because you know that I'm going to truly take care of you. You're not going to be hassle. You're not going to be rushed out. It's not about the tip. It was just about serving you. So I was like, wow. So I started to really love that. Well, I'd had the GM of a big car dealership back in Sioux City at this time. And I go in to buy my first car. And he asked my buddy, he says, hey, is, is that Casanova out there? Because I was buying it from a friend. And he says, yeah. He says, well, ask him if he has, you know, any uh, interest in selling cars. And keep in mind, my parents never even owned a car. So I couldn't tell you about a 1978 Chevy Nova or nothing like that. So as my buddy comes back out there and I'm sitting across waiting to sign papers so we can leave with the car, I, I, I think about it and I ask my wife and I'm like, nah, because all I had in my mind was use sleazy car salesman. Mm. So I'm like, nah, like I'm good on that. Well, as all sales managers are, he was very persistent. And he gets me to come back and uh, a couple of days later, and he says, let me ask you, what are your goals in life? And I said, you know, I just want to make $100,000. And I didn't really know like what that really meant. It was just that like magic number for me. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to be a six figure man. And he's, uh, and yeah. I'm like, yeah, $100,000. How old and are you at like, the time? By the At way, this time, curious. I am what twenty five. Right, I think I'm about twenty five years old. Figure man on his way. Yeah, on his way. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So <laughs> I'm like, that's what I want to do. I always have these big dreams. And, um, and so he's like, well, how much did you make last year at the, at the, the restaurant? And I'm like, well, I made about what I think it was like 45,000, but I was able to, you know, pick up shifts, drop them when I like, I got cash tips. I didn't really have to pay a lot in taxes, all these other things. So he's like, okay, well, you see these three guys outside of my glass office. And so I turn around and I see he's like, all three of those guys made over $90,000 last year two of which made over 110 and the one who didn't he was a year younger than me one or two years younger than me but he went to a different high school but we at least knew of each other so now he's pushing my hot buttons right <laughs> and i'm like okay so now we're at least talking the same language and he's like listen i'm not saying that you're going to come in here and make over one hundred and ten thousand dollars." he's like but i know potential when i see it and you my friend have potential so long story short he was able to get me to come sell for him and I knew nothing about cars. Well, quickly within six months, the, the fifth and sixth month, I got car salesman of the month out of 27 other reps. And, uh, and in Iowa, I'm selling Kias, right? So if you know anything about the Midwest, it's very, very Americanized. Like they don't want to see nothing about no Kias and Korean cars and <laughs> things like that. It's, just, it's not as progressive of that type of a mindset. So oh, yeah. how was I doing? I was just building relationships. Right. And then but how the personal development thing comes about is I'm working a lot of hours. Keep in mind, my son's just over one years old at this time. He's about one and a half. And now he's going through that potty training stage stage. So I'm seeing that I'm losing a lot of time with him because I'm at this dealership m many days, like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So mm -hmm. I'm not really feeling that. And then at the same, same time as well, uh, my old like seventh grade football coach gives me a call and he says, hey, are you looking to make some extra money on the side so you could start to create some extra time? Now, I didn't know what he was referring to, but it then came to be a network marketing company, one of the granddaddy of them all, probably Amway, mm -hmm. um, if you've ever heard of that. So he... Yeah. So he asked me to come to an Amway meeting and I wound up joining in the Amway. What that taught me, though, was that for me, again, I had to figure out what I didn't like. And I thought that at that time in my life, um, those products and services were not for me. Now, I will say that what was for me was what I was exposed to, which was, personal in your question, the right. personal development. So that was the first time anybody ever told me about like rich dad, poor dad richest man in Babylon, mm. go for no, all of these other things. And I was like, wow, oh my God, I, I love all of this. And what more importantly, after I read that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it taught me that I was trading my time for money. I couldn't sell a car if I wasn't at the dealership. Now, keep in mind that seven years prior to that, I had already, I was two weeks away from death because I went through stage four cancer. So two years of chemotherapy. So my mind was already like racing of like, I got to capitalize now because no day is promised to me. 
right? So that all combined with it, it really just was like, listen, how can I figure out a way to move from the E quadrant, if you know anything about the cash flow quadrants, from the E to the I. So E is the employee, right? Trading my time for money, working for someone else to the I, which is being an investor and making my money work for me, making my time work for me and making my impact work for me. Mm. So that was what I wanted to do. And then at the time, it just seemed like Amway was going to give me a better option. And then the big congregation was down here in Omaha. And so basically a guy who was also a part of that said, hey, listen, man, if you come down here and move down here to Omaha, which is about an hour and a half away, we'll help you get a job down here where you only got to work basically eight to five. You put your 40 hours in, a lot of incentives for you to even get you know, more time off. So you're really only working about 30 hours. But when you're not working, you can quote unquote, build the business. And, uh, and then, so that was the route that I went on. And um, I tried that out. The Amway thing didn't, you know, really stay long with me. I think I did it for about, you know, six to eight months. And then I, I just kind of stayed on my path of just being exposed to new things. That's where the digital marketing came in. And then later on, real estate came in. Casanova, one thing that we always try to do on this podcast is bring massive perspective to people. We've had Eric Legrand on who was paralyzed when he was playing football, Isabella Picard, half of her body was paralyzed when she was playing softball. For you, it was cancer, right? You had something that a lot of people don't know what it's like to deal with. Can you take us through what it was like going through that whole uh, journey, what it was like finding out? And to this day, what mindset shifts did having and beating cancer, like, what did you take from that? Yeah. So what it was like going through it. Well, at this time, I'm, I'm a sophomore in high school. I am very active in sports, basketball, football, track, and I'm dance squad. And in Sioux City, Iowa, at least during that era, we were national champions. So, I mean, we traveled. Um, we did nationals down in Texas and lots of awards. You could, yeah, Google it. And it was a really big thing. So I was very active. I was very popular. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, football season's getting done. I'd actually quit football. This was my sophomore year. So I'd quit football about a month prior to the season ending and I was waiting on a basketball. So that was probably going to be my time where I just stopped playing football. I just didn't want to put on the helmet anymore. I was always playing. I was starting, but I just, it wasn't my thing anymore. And I was a little guy. So I, I just, they, I lost the love out of that and I was ready for basketball. Well, anyway, as basketball season starts up, of course, when you start out the season, you do a lot of conditioning. And so I remember walking through the hallways and telling my buddies who I was walking through the hallways with like, hey, man, I can't breathe. And they're like, ah, it's probably because you didn't finish out football season. So you're just out of shape. And I'm like, oh, you know what? You're probably right. Now, keep in mind, I was never, ever sick as a kid. Never had the chicken pox, the measles, none of that. So I was like, OK, you're probably right. But then as I got home after school, um, I would instantly just take a nap. And it's super early. And so my mom started to be like, hey, wh what's up with you? And I'm like, I just can't breathe, things like that. And it's like, okay, well, if this persists over the next day or two, like we're going to go to the doctor. And then it's just like, okay. So it did persist over the next day or two. And winds up uh, one night, we just go to the emergency room. And, uh, and because obviously this is, I think around like seven, eight o'clock at night and uh, we go to the emergency room. And then they saying, Hey, you know, we're going to do some more testing since you're talking about your chest and breathing and we're going to keep you overnight. And so for me growing up again, I was never sick. So all I knew was like on the TV again, I've always been ignorant to so many things. And, and so to, to talk to you about how I was ignorant then I was just thinking, you know, Know, hey, I'm going to get a sponge bath from a nurse. I'm going to get ice cream. Like that was really my mindset. I'm like, this is going to be great. And then they wound up coming back in after doing all these tests at about 1 a.m. in the morning. And, and I remember the doctor distinctly just saying like, hey, you know, we think it might be a little bit more serious. Um, we actually have some public transportation and we're going to, you know, ship you guys to the University of Iowa, which is on the other side of the state, four and a half hours away. And, and my mom is like, like, what do you mean? Like, what did, what are you trying to say? Da, da, da. And, and so she kind of like pries it out. And the doctor's like, well, we think he may have cancer. And I just remember my grandma saying like, whoa, like 
like what what like what are you talking about and they're like yeah um we think it's pretty severe so we have the transportation on the way and you know you guys should be there in the next like five hours or so so we get there and do all this you know additional testing and all this other stuff and the doctor winds up coming in and says yeah you know he has stage four it's all throughout his body swollen lymph nodes everything um you know if he would have waited just two more weeks he could have just died And so it's like, oh, and I mean, I'm 15 at the time and I didn't know really a lot of things about the C word. So more so I'm thinking of like my reputation and and things like that and like how I'm not going to be able to play sports. I'm not really thinking of like death. I'm Mm. just thinking of like, what's my image going to be like? Right. Because I'm such a young kid at this time. Mm. And uh, and so that was that was huge, huge for me, because as I got back. Um, from the, I was stayed in that hospital for 45 days. So they ran all these tests, all these chemicals, dyes, all these other things to just get me prepared to where I didn't have to always go there, but I could go to the cancer center in um, my the town that we were living in, which was Sioux City. And so then when I got back, of course, it's it's so much different because it's basically similar to um, Eric Legrand, right? Where in one moment you're like a superstar, and in the blink of an eye you're a victim. Mm. Right? So everyone's now looking at me different. Like people are coming up. How are you feeling? Things like that. But I'm kind of living in a never let them see you sweat approach. So I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. But yet in all, like I'm not keeping a lot of food down, all these other things that was just like, man, but I, but then you also deal with the fact that you have young kids, right? As in 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. And the world can be very cruel at that time. Oh, yeah. So my friend's would like make jokes and be like, oh man, like if you, you don't stop talking, I'm gonna knock that port out your chest. Cause I had a port that stuck in my chest. So that meant that I couldn't play football, basketball anymore because it was connected to my jugular. And so if I got hit the wrong way, I could die. Right. So there is a lot of things like that. And it was just a joke. And I don't think that they meant it with the intent to like be a bully or whatever. But again, at the same time, my situation wasn't as as uh, what's the word that I'm looking for as visible as like an Eric Legrand, because when you see him, obviously he's in a wheelchair, things like that. So you see it. But whereas for me, I look normal, right? Cause the pore in my chest, it's covered up by my shirt, things like that. So you couldn't really tell. So when they would make these jokes, obviously I had to develop a thick skin. Mm. I had to also be able to just kind of live by that. Never let them see you sweat. But once it was all said and done, I remember again, distinctly telling my mom and my grandma, like, Hey, if it ever comes back again, you know, I'm going out comfort care style. And, but now looking at it, obviously I have a wife, I have a son, I have a daughter, I have a lot of other people who depend on me. So I would never, ever do that. I would go through it. But at that time, being 17 years old, you know, there was a lot that happened to me in that two year period mentally more than anything else that just made me think like, listen, if if it comes back again, I don't, maybe it just meant the, like, I'm not supposed to go through this, but, um, my mom and grandma led the way of being a huge support, you know, followed by my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, saw me through a lot of that. And, uh, it was, yeah, I had a huge, huge, strong support system. My goodness. That's, I can't imagine being at that age going through something so life altering and you seem like such a a positive human being and it seems like you have used your experiences and everything that you've been through to like make sure that like how often do you think about that do you ever reflect on that and like what do you do for gratitude do you practice gratitude consistently. Yeah. So I always think about it in the sense of you, st- I still have side effects from it. Now I, they're not major side effects, but like for me, like I, my circulation, because obviously chemotherapy kills off all the bad cells. Right. That's why you have it. But then it also kills off a lot of your good cells. So for me, like my circulation is very bad in my fingers. So it could be 85 degrees out, but if I grab a cold bottle of water, um, it, it, my hands will still get really white. And obviously living in Nebraska, it sucks as well because because you get a lot of snow and it's really cold. So that always keeps it in my mind and my perspective. But I think it also, we know that fear, fear can do one of two things. One, you can allow it to hold you back or two, it can propel you forward. And so for me, I, would, I wouldn't I would say that I don't have any fear. I think I have lots of fears, but I use that fear of like, even, you know, death being honest to say, listen, let's say that my life expectancy, you know, when I first was born was 70 years, right? We're going through this chemotherapy, the dyes, the pills, the everything else. Let's say that that took off 10 years out of my life. So now being 32 years old, 
I don't have as much time as I would. So in the time that I do have now, I have to make sure that I capitalize on every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, up until every year, right? And on top of that, I have to make sure that I leave the people. Let's look at Kobe Bryant and let's look at the impact that he just left on this world, right? And in 41 years, I would argue to say, you know, we have to find some type of positivity out of everything. Mm. And so I was talking to a buddy of mine, um, this was last week, and and for so many people, the death of Kobe, especially his daughter, um, and everyone else that was in that, you know, helicopter, it makes you question your faith as to say. Say like why like it, like what was the 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 positivity what was the positive factor out of that especially losing those young girls who hadn't had a chance to put any type of a positive spin they did in their own way but I think you get where I'm going mm-hmm. they had so much more to give to this world mm. and so when I think of that I say listen right now at least in America and I think all over the country we're so or all over the world we're so divided right now but Kobe's death. I've never seen one person thus far in at least my era that's brought as many people together for one, you know, for one death, right? So what do I mean by that? I mean, we think of Michael Jackson, we think of all these other people who were icons in their own way, but yet they had such a blemish on their name for one reason or another that it didn't like, whether it was politics of, oh, he was a Republican or Michael Jackson of, oh, he had these crimes, but Kobe and his daughter, like this really united our country, even for that short amount of time. Right. So just trying to always find some type of a positive factor out of it. So for me, what it allowed me to do was to push that much forward because we all have an unfair advantage in life. And whether mine is building relationships or using my energy and my charisma to try to inspire the next person, I have to be able to make sure that I can have as much of an impact on this world in my short amount of time here. So at the end of the day, when I get to those gates or when I get to whoever my maker is, right, and no matter what I worshiped or I praised or whatever, if if I didn't do it the right way, I can know in my heart of hearts and I can say to that person with conviction, did I do everything and did I touch as many people as I could and try to bring positive energy to their life to try to make your world a better place? And if that answer is yes, I feel like he's got to let me in or she's got to let me in. So Mm -hmm. that's what I think. I That's how I bring my gratitude. On top of that, I think how I always find some type of gratitude is a couple different ways. One, so my both of my children, my wife and I, because of our situation, we were told early on in, in our pregnancy stage. So this was two years prior to my son being born. This was 10, 10 years ago. And uh, they had said, hey, you know what? Um, the average couple, which goes to conceive on any given night, they have about a 15% chance of conception and reproduction. Well, because of my wife and I's situation and hers and then me having the cancer, we had less than a 1% chance. And so they had told us that at the University of Iowa, and this was, again, 10 years ago, so this was about three to four years post me having chemotherapy and me being in remission, um, they had said, you have, two shop- you have two options. You can go the artificial insemination route or you can go the um, in vitro fertilization route. Artificial insemination was about um, $1,300 a pop. And then in vitro was about $13,000 a pop at that time. Now it's more like $30,000 a pop. Um, but anyway, so we didn't have any either of those. You know, we were just servers, her and I. So we didn't have that money. My mom winds up giving, she had a little bit of money in her money marketing account. And so she obviously wanted a grandchild. So my mom winds up giving us the $1,300, which is almost all of what she had. And uh, and then, so we tried the artificial insemination route um, with one of my vows that they had me put in. I had two vows and I'm giving you guys the real raw and dirty. So hopefully that's okay for you. Of your- course, please. Yeah. So we had two vows that they had me put in before I even started any chemotherapy. So anybody who you know that this, you know, before they become a grown man, they're going to have you do put some some basically some semen in a vow and and they're going to go that route. So they had me do that at 15 years old. And so I had these two vows. So you had to use a whole vow um, with the artificial insemination route. And so my mom winds up paying, we try that route and 45 days later, my wife gets her period. 
Right. So now we're like, oh, my God, we're devastated because it's like, OK, well, now what are we going to do? Like and then I remember calling up one of my buddies and I cried to him on the phone and I'm like, man, what did I do to be so cursed in this world? Like I never killed, I never stole from anybody. I never did anything. Why can't I reproduce? And, you know, and we had already been looking at adoption. I was never opposed to giving another child a better life. And um, and so anyway, 45 days later, my wife gets her period. And then about another 45 days later, we just keep trying. Um, we conceive naturally to having my son. And so that was huge for us. And, and it was a miracle. And the doctor said it was a miracle and all these other things. And, and so that was really good. And then fast forward six years later, we have been trying for two years again um, to have my daughter. And we were looking at adoption again. The, and um, the, the reason why we were going to adopt this time is because, again, we, we didn't we didn't have the money and all that other thing. And it caused a lot of stress. But what we, we wound up having my daughter naturally as well. And uh, and th- it, it, for, without going too much more deeper into that, both of our children have been miracle babies. Neither one of them, fortunately enough for us, um, even had to go through the NICU. They both came out, you know, um, natural uh, births. And so it's a lot of fun. So for me, I always reflect back on that. And I say, listen, like I, at least some people aren't even able to have one for me being able to have two healthy children. My son loves basketball, which I love basketball. My daughter is, she got so much personality and, uh, that's been enough for me to be able to be grateful every single day as well. I mm, appreciate you sharing that. That was really, really powerful. Yeah, that was raw and real. And I think again, like a lot of people sugarcoat stuff and and you've been through a lot of things that have made you the man that you are today and the more that you share the better that people are going to know you and they're going to connect with you and i appreciate it being it, it's hard to be vulnerable sometimes and you're doing a very good job of that and we appreciate that more than you know thank you yeah i try i understand what people are right we all deal with our own demons we all deal with our own problems and it doesn't matter how much success that you think that you have in this world right like at the end of the day it's all about the memories that we create and the lives that we impact and so for me i again it's about being selfish i know that there's somebody else out there right now that might not be directly affected by cancer but yet they have somebody who is um battling cancer or is directly affected by it in some way and so how can they be a support to that person and how can they understand what the backside of this looks like so then they can offer whether it's friendship a business relationship or whatever inspiration to just keep that person going forward well you are definitely inspiring us yeah very very much so kevin and i always have two questions we ask um we're coming up on the end here kevin just yeah. redid the camera actually so we have a little bit more time but my question i'm actually going to do a little bit of a switch and then kevin will ask his so last and final question from me casanova is your podcast is called dream nation one of the things that i i often tell people if you want to find your purpose I think it comes from, as one of our mentors mentions, your deepest pain for sure. What do you want to help other people with? But I, I, So I want to know what moves you emotionally most. And one of the things that moves me emotionally is, is people not maximizing their potential. And when I wasn't maximizing my potential and when I was you know, t- turning to vices rather than virtues, that was my deepest pain. And now I help others maximize their potential. Your podcast is called dream nation and it genuinely i don't know if pisses me off is the right phrase (laughs) but it bothers me to my core that people don't chase their dreams or even have them why do you believe more people don't have dreams yeah so i believe that everybody has a dream and that is where dream nation comes from for me and so the reason why this came about was i believe that everyone Uh, everything starts with a dream, Mm -hmm. right? When we're young kids, we all have these dreams that we want to be a lawyer, an astronaut, or now a YouTuber, or, you know, a Fortnite player, or, (laughs) you know, have our own talk show host, whatever it is, right? We want to have all these things, but yet we allow fear to set into us. And so why do we allow that fear? Is because once we become like 14, 15, 16, again, at the heart of it, a lot other people start to put their expectations and their fears on us. And we don't feel like that we have a tribe around us to be able to protect that from us. So then we lose sight of that and we start to fit in in a world where every, or we start to, 
yeah, try to fit in in a world where everybody who we worship stands out. Right. Think of Beyonce. Think of Elon Musk. Think of Joe Rogan. It doesn't matter. Right. They stand out and they become authentic to who they are. So for me, when I first thought about this podcast, Dream Nation, and what was my goal, what did I want to convey? Well, here's what happened. And this is, again, my podcast has been around for about seven months now. But I started to think about my son, and he went through this phase. Luckily, he doesn't anymore, but he went through this phase when he would walk upstairs. His bedroom is down the hallway. And so his bedroom is on the right. His sister's bedroom is on the left. They're right next to each other. But he'd have to walk down this hallway of about 15 feet. And if there's no lights on or, or whatever, he'd instantly like come back and he'd be like, I heard something or I'm scared, essentially is what he's saying. And so I would have to what walk upstairs, turn on the light and show him like, hey, buddy, there's nothing to be afraid of. Right. Look, like I'll check the closet. I'll look under the bed. You're OK. Right. And then so he would lay in bed and, and maybe he start a little bit of fears, but he would at least go to sleep. And so now I know that. You know, he's comfortable enough to go upstairs, turn on the light, do what he needs to do, and he's good. But what's going to happen here over the next three, maybe four years, my daughter's probably maybe even sooner, she's going to start to go through that same phase, right? But what will happen? Hopefully, I've done my job well enough and I've instilled enough confidence and empowered CJ enough that now he can go upstairs, turn on that light and show his sister, hey, there's nothing to be afraid of right? You got this. Like I'm up here. There's no one up here. We're good. So I think that that's what happens. Like when we focus on, you know, living a life by our design, I believe everything starts with that dream. And those of us who dare to dream while the rest of the world is living um, with the failures that other people have put on to them, if we continue to just push forward, we stand to be the change makers and we can really help other people live a life by their design. Kevin, wrote, absolutely. Such a fire response. I appreciate that so much. Kevin wrote on the whiteboard a bunch of notes and I just want you to know that it says exposure to possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I wrote it I wrote it down quick. So exposure to possibilities will bring you This dreams. was actually when we were on the beginning of the call with you. And the funny thing is Alan doesn't have any notes, so he doesn't get to make fun of mine. <laughs> right. So Very true. I want to make sure, as promised, because if Alan takes the rest of this, he's just going to keep talking because he <laughs> loves asking questions. And your story is amazing and you are an amazing individual i want to make sure that people can find out more about you so obviously you have the dream nation podcast where else can people find you where can they hire you where can they see you speak where can they get your book all of the good things plug away my friend yeah, absolutely. So for social media, I'm the most active. I'm on every single social media platform. I would say that I'm the most active on Instagram, um, but you can find me on LinkedIn, um, Facebook, Twitter. It, everything is Casanova Brooks. So C-A-S-A-N-O-V-A and then last name B-R-O-O-K-S. Um, if you're interested in real estate or if you're interested in, in understanding more about how I mentor, um, feel free to go to Casanova brooks.com c-a-s-a-n-o-v-a um, b-r-o-o-k-s dot com and shoot me a message or shoot me a dm however and and you know i'd love to to be able to see what your goals are and to figure out how i can help you so i have one final question before we let you go my question is simple what do you hope to accomplish before you die and who will you have to become in order to accomplish it Wow. That's a great, great question. What do I hope to accomplish before I die? I think with thinking bigger, I hope to impact the lives of a billion people that say, hey, because of you, I learned something new or I got out of my comfort zone and went after another part of my dream. Mm. Right. So that's what I that's what would be ideal for me. And who do I have to become to be that person? I think that I have to continue to be a success. So what does that mean? I think most of the time people want to learn from someone who is just a couple steps ahead. So when people think of me, I don't try to portray myself as being, you know, the, the hundred millionaire guy or any of those things, because then it, it becomes distant to try to really connect with that person. So for me, I always try to meet people where they are. Mm. So I have to continue to be a success, which means because people like 
here's here's something that I learned in the beginning. And I got this from one of my, I would consider mentors, which is Jay-Z. And he says, everybody could tell you how to do it, but they've never done it. Mm. Right. So you have to be taking some sort of action to allow people to show that it's not the blind leading the blind. Now, mm. while I said now why I said a success, but not successful is because I have to continue to fight along my journey. Once you become successful, you can get into a rut or you can become content or even comfortable. And I don't ever want to become successful, which means that I'm full and I don't have anywhere else to go because there's always something more I can learn. And there's always somebody else that I can impact and inspire. But what that's going to do is first, or what that really means is first off, I have to continue to figure out what it is that I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. Because I don't know what I don't know. So the only way that I can do that is by possibilities. (laughs) I have to be exposed to those possibilities. (laughs) And then from there, I think that it'll allow me to learn, to earn, and then to teach more people what I've just found. And so again, that's all I try to be. I think that's what the podcast, that's what my (laughs) platform is. I try to be a platform or I try to be a bridge that can give other people the tools and the inspiration to then become as successful and go after some part of their dream. Oh, oh that goodness. was hilarious. That was Strong hilarious. Work. So <laughs> Alan and I have never done a podcast interview in Omaha, Nebraska. So I think we are going to set the intention to make it out there eventually to interview you in person because you added a ton of value and I feel like... Your story is an, an amazing one, but you're also an amazing human. We can feel that warm heart and uh, that positivity all the way over here, and we appreciate you for spending time with us today, Casanova. Yeah, thank you. It's been fun. And, uh, yeah, if you're ever in Omaha, reach out to me. Let me know. Uh, I always love to connect with people. I feel like I'm a little bit better in person, um, but, you know, I, again, I'm, I, I try to be versatile as, however I can. So it was great talking to you guys. I appreciate you, fellas. We appreciate you. If you're ever in Boston, be sure to reach out. And if you need anything at all, please reach out to Kevin or myself. We'll be happy to help you with anything we can. The possibilities are endless. <laughs> right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well, we'll definitely get onto that, and um, we'll stay in touch for sure. Right Sounds on. good. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Casanova Brooks. Talk to you soon. Bye.